The Radical Art of Eric Drucker, Part 2, ABC No Rio, August 2nd, 1996. Introduction by Thule Kupferberg and videographer Norman Savage. The entrance to the park, the marchers were met by a wall of cops who blocked their way out as another row of cops closed in from behind. At that point, people tried to disperse. Uh, that reminds me of an incident. Uh, this was during the Vietnam War at a naval depot in New Jersey. We had gone there to uh, block symbolically and some permanently or with their bodies uh, the railroad tracks that led to a ship that was loading munitions for that great, that great uh, party in Vietnam, you know, the party to kill as many people as you can in the shortest period of time. Um, I was there, and I didn't intend to get arrested that day, and we were told that we would have a dispersal uh, notice read, you know, like, you hereby disperse or you will be arrested and beaten the shit out, uh, have the shit beaten out of you in jail. No, you, uh, uh, disperse, it's the riot act, basically, you know. If you leave, you're supposed to uh, get off. Now, they did start to read uh, the, the uh, official uh, police notice, but as one guy was reading it, the other cops were going around and rounding people up and stopping them from getting away. In other words, then they were going to tell the judge, yes, we read the dispersal notice. Sure, they began to, but they really wanted to arrest everybody they could at the spot. Now, since there were so many people there and not that many cops, uh, some of us managed to duck and, and escape. I remember, you know, I was being grabbed, and I just, uh, a friend of mine and I, we, we escaped, we, we ran. There was a bus stop nearby. We kept walking, and a bus just happened to be passed. It was passing. It was our lucky day, and we escaped without being arrested that day. But here, uh, I don't think Eric was so lucky, uh, and a lot of other people. Uh, at that point, people tried to disperse, but cops refused to let anyone leave. The shadow overheard 9th Precinct Captain Kenneth Kelleher tell Chief Alan Ho, I'm going to arrest them all, Hull replied. Good. Quickly, a line of cops made their way into the crowd, randomly surrounding more than 30 people by linking arms. Those caught in the cop circle were jumped and arrested. Those who broke out of the trap and took off avoided arrest, the lucky guys and gals. Cops justified their mass arrest of marchers and bystanders by citing a parks regulation that they claim allows no more than 20 people to gather in a city park without a permit. Now, I wonder if there was 19 people and a pregnant woman there, whether that would be considered 20 people. I think that would be a, a question for the Supreme Court to decide, don't you think? And uh, let's see. Um, well, no more than 20 people. Among those arrested were Rabbi Freed, maybe he could have given a, 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 a drush on that, um, whose synagogue provides AIDS patients with pot, and shadow artist Eric Drucker, who was violently choked as other cops held his hands behind his back. Several of those arrested were roughed up and beaten by cops who refused to tell anyone what they were being charged for. I can't uh, remember uh, when I met uh, Eric Drucker, but I think it was uh, at uh, a uh, an activity we were we were activists uh, to prevent or try and uh, protest and prevent the eviction of um, the homeless from Tompkins Square Park several years ago. Now Eric Drucker is in the great uh, tradition of. Uh, radical graphic artist that goes way, way back, I don't know how far, probably to uh, uh, Da Vinci and Michael, no, well, uh, all good art, I think, is uh, radical, but uh, specifically political art, uh, the people I remember from uh, the modern period uh, were, were include uh, Daumier, uh, Corbet and Nadar, who were uh, active participants in the Paris Commune of uh, 1871, the Pissarro, the anarchist Pissarro, um, one of the uh, fathers of the Impressionist movement, Masriel, Belgian um, 
would cut artists. And uh, the uh, fucking commie Picasso. These were all anarchists or um, communists or anarcho-communists or communist anarchists, uh, democratic anarcho-communist anarchists. And in Germany in the first part of the century, the, the immortal George Gross and Hartfield and our own America, uh, people like Art Young, John Sloan, Jackson Pollock, Ben Sean, and then the 60s, uh, the great Ron Cobb and Art Crumb. Um, now Norman is going to tell you about uh, the event that took place at ABC in Rio. No, Rio at uh, a little while ago. and. Uh, uh, talk about the slideshow that uh, Eric and his friends presented. Norman. Okay, well, here it is. This is the uh, Eric's poster from the slide presentation you're about to see. And uh, let's see, it's, uh, it was a book party for Illuminated Poems by Allen Ginsberg, which Eric illustrated. And... Uh, illustrated Alan's poems, and uh, the night, the, the evening featured uh, jazz poet extraordinaire Terry Kid Lucky Lewis, who was a rapper who was uh, coming on in the basement in the latter part of the evening, and then there was Carla Cubitt, who was a belly dancer, who was in the earlier part of the evening, maybe, maybe we'll see some of that, uh, and then Moroccan fiddler Hafid who uh, accompanied Carla and some drummers. Eric was, was one of the drummers. And the apocalyptic folk singer Stefan Saeed is listed over here, but uh, he had something uh, even more apocalyptic came up for him, and he didn't show up. But uh, it was Friday, August 2nd, and uh, Eric called it a Midsummer Night's Madness. And uh, it was a fun evening, and I hope you enjoy it. And uh, what's the title of the book and the publisher? The uh, Illuminated Poems, and the, the publisher is, uh, I don't know who the publisher is. Four windows, eight Four doors. Four windows and eight doors. Four windows and eight doors and an elevator. Three walls and a roof. You'll find it if you look for it. Yeah. My first guest, sit down. Sorry about the standing room only. If you're an artist in New York City, especially in this neighborhood, it's never a hang up what you're going to draw. You just look out the window and you get inspired. I uh, look out my window one morning and I see these guys, and right away I'm kind of envious and kind of jealous of these dudes because they're in the union. They get paid union scale. And I, don't. <laughs> and I always wonder if artists, if we're ever going to get that one together. Okay, no one draws or paints anything until we get paid. Because uh, <laughs> <laughs> the theme of, of tonight's, what do you call it? I don't want to call it a lecture. Okay, Midsummer Night's Madness. The theme is the, the neighborhood itself, growing up in the Lower East Side. And, uh, or just growing up in any city, anywhere on the planet. I think that city dwellers, uh, develop a very keen sense of 
well, as a survival mechanism, we, we develop uh, uh, just a different way of seeing things. There's so much death and decay all around that we, we uh, develop uh, 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 unusual places of finding beauty. That's it. <laughs> Pigeons definitely have the best view of this city, the most objective view of humanity, I think. Pigeon in the sky, flying through the air, I wouldn't even care, and I wish I was a pigeon in the sky. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And the Lord said, go to, let us go down and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth. And they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord was there confounds the language of all the earth. Yeah, I came across that somewhere. Um, then I picked up my, my dictionary. I just looked up Babel in the dictionary. It's a city where Noah's descendants, who spoke one language, tried to build a tower to heaven. For this presumption, 
they lost the ability to speak intelligibly to each other. It's kind of familiar, living in Manhattan Island, especially the Lower East Side with all these different languages and stuff, and the confusion of tongues, right? Then in the dictionary, this noun, babble, a place or a scene of noise and confusion, hubbub, racket, din, uproar, or the verb infinitive, to babble, to utter meaningless sounds, to talk foolishly or excessively. This is another myth that I feel is very much alive in the 20th century. You, you all recognize this dude, right? Who is this? Edgar. Who? Edgar. Okay. Uh, close. Daedalus, that's right. And you actually, I guess you couldn't tell this from this picture. I, that, in fact, that's the question. Is this Daedalus, the artist, the designer, I don't know, the guy who invented the wings and escaped from the labyrinth, or is this his, his uh, compulsive uh, teenage son, Icarus, who wouldn't stop and kept flying higher and higher into the air when his father was telling him, you know, that the wings, they're made of wax. If you keep flying <laughs> close to the sun, their wings are going to melt. I'm telling you, of course. Icarus is a teenager and wasn't about to listen to his father, and he was having a good time. He was flying right into the sun. That was the deal. The king had commissioned Daedalus, the artist, to build a labyrinth to put the Minotaur. And, um, and uh, some years later, Daedalus himself got on the king's bad side. Apparently, it's never too difficult to get on the king's bad side. Uh, his punishment, the king threw both him and his son in the maze, and that's when he had to invent these wings. So they work, but his, his, uh, his son... Um, well, I, I keep thinking a recent example of the Icarus syndrome in our culture is Kurt Cobain, right? That's burned out, flew right into the sun. Or Jimi Hendrix, or Joplin, or any—the whole uh, his landscape of rock and roll is littered with the bodies of people who uh, have burned out from the Icarus syndrome. But more recently, it occurred to me that our whole Western civilization seems to be suffering from the terminal stages of the Icarus syndrome. That is, our, our the wings that we invented, our, the technology that was supposed to set us free. Remember, all the machinery from the Industrial Revolution was supposed to liberate us, but then we seem to have gotten carried away with all of this hardware and technology, and we seem to be in a mad rush for some reason, as if like, there was a finite amount of time to fly directly into the sun. This is the resurrection of Icarus. It always comes around again if you wait long enough. A lot of the, the color paintings here are from a uh, new book that I finally finished uh, with Allen Ginsberg. A collaboration with his, his poems and then my paintings of drawings to go with them. This is a, a poem about Neil Cassidy, burned out really young. This is one of the illuminations for the poem Howl. I assume everyone knows that inside and out, right? But anyway, I, it was written two years before I was born, 1956. Uh, Howl was written 40 years ago. And it seems to ring true, right? Even truer now. Like, you know, I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness, starving, hysterical naked. We all know someone who OD'd, who jumped out the window. The pusher man wants ten dollars more. The pusher man wants ten dollars more. When he gave it to me, he said it would be free. Now the pusher man wants ten dollars more. Oh, there goes Gimsy now on the roof. Doesn't even have a sense to come in out of the rain. 
someone want to hand me one of those books? Maybe I could. I'm just kind of winding up a book tour, and I was with Alan on a lot of the way. He would read the poems while I projected the slides. Alan's in LA right now. So. Yeah, yeah. yeah but he sends his regards. This was a fairly recent poem, I think an unpublished that I discovered. He basically just gave me all his poetry and trusted me to come up with something. We've known each other just from the street, from the neighborhood over the years. He had been collecting street posters all this time, and uh, we realized we were coming from a similar place. It was kind of natural harmony, I guess you'd call it. Rock song, I'm up in the lightning tower. Blake is refighting Milton below. African Americans yelling at Latinos with bombs, crack, wanna blow? African Americans with babies at their breasts. Europeans drinking coffee, cashing checks. Vietnamese and Chinese behaving correct. Koreans and Texans thumping their chests. I'm up in the lightning tower, could stay up here a hundred years, shouting orders through a diamond megaphone till the blood rain turns to humor tears. I'm up in the lightning tower, the spiritual war goes on. There's a million Caesars climbing up the stairs. I gotta fight them with one heart on. I'm up in the lightning window. I can see the blare of the bombs. The noisier the surplus airplanes thunder, the more I sit down calm. Up on the lightning rooftop, it's raining human bones and blood. I haven't got a holy umbrella. Is there anything I could do that's any good? I'm dancing on the lightning cloud. I don't know how I got the power. I kept hearing everybody screaming and lay down to sleep dream for one hour. Lightning tower, lightning ocean, lightning window, lightning cloud, lightning solitude, lightning delusion, lightning consciousness in the crowd. This is a fairly early poem he wrote around the time of Owl, the Sunflower Sutra. That's Alan uh, on the left holding the sunflower, and that's Kerouac on the right hand holding the bottle, uh, sitting on the track. I walked on the banks of the tin can banana dock and sat down under the huge shade of the Southern Pacific locomotive to look at the sunset over the box house hills and cry. Jack Kerouac sat, sat beside me on a busted, busted, rusty iron pole. Companion, we thought the same thoughts of the soul, bleak and blue-eyed and sad-eyed, surrounded by the gnarled steel roots of trees of machinery. So I grabbed up the skeleton thick sunflower and stuck it at my side like a scepter and deliver my sermon to my soul and Jack's soul too and anyone who will listen. We're not our skin of grime. We're not our dread, bleak, dusty, imageless locomotive. We're all golden sunflowers inside, blessed by our own seed and hairy naked accomplishment bodies, growing into mad black formal sunflowers in the sunset spied on by our eyes under the shadow of the mad locomotive, riverbank, sunset, Frisco, hilly tin can, evening sit-down vision. This is a poem called The Lion For Real. A guy comes back home from a long day at the office, finds a lion in his living room. I came home and found a lion in my living room rushed out on the fire escape, screaming, Lion! Lion! Two stenographers pulled their brunette hair and banged the window shut. I hurried home to Patterson and stayed two days. Called up my own Reichian analyst, who kicked me out of therapy for smoking marijuana. It's happened, I panted. There's a lion in my room. I'm afraid any discussion would have no value. He hung up. <laughs> Uh, painting didn't really go to any specific poem of Allen's. It just sort of captured the mood of, of many of his poems. Made of New York. What happens to you if you fall asleep on the L train? <laughs> the first picture.
literature in the book. I figured it was a good place to start things out. <laughs> Bird Brain. People know that one? He recorded it as a song back in the 80s. It got a lot of play on the college radio station. It's pretty funny. The, the poems that I selected, in effect, I edited the book, but uh, I, I tended to lean toward either the more political poems of Allen's or else just the funnier, the funniest ones. Birdbrain runs the world. Birdbrain is the ultimate product of capitalism. Birdbrain, chief bureaucrat of Russia, yawning. Birdbrain ran FBI 30 years appointed by F.D. Roosevelt and never chased Cosa Nostra. Birdbrain apportions wheat to be burned, keeps prices up on the world market. Birdbrain lends money to developing nation police states through the International Monetary Fund. Birdbrain never gets laid on his own. He depends on his office to pimp for him. Birdbrain offers brain transplants in Switzerland. Birdbrain wakes up in the middle of the night and arranges his sheets. <laughs> I am Birdbrain. I rule Russia, Yugoslavia, England, Poland, Argentina, United States, El Salvador. Birdbrain multiplies in China. Birdbrain inhabits Stalin's corpse inside the Kremlin wall. Birdbrain dictates petrochemical agriculture in Africa desert regions. Birdbrain lowers North California's water table, sucking it up for Orange County agribusiness bank. Birdbrain harpoons whales and chews blubber in the tropics. Birdbrain clubs baby harp seals and wears their coats to Paris. What's going on? Yeah, Clyde is wearing low top. Here we come to the story within the story. Dreams within dreams. I came across this uh, poem in a, some book I found in my grandmother's attic. Because at the very beginning of the book, it was an example of primitive poetry translated roughly into English. An Eskimo hunter, a seal hunter, was out hunting one day, and the ice, the piece of ice he was standing on broke, and he went floating out to sea made up this song. I, uh, I am joyful, this is good. Roughly translated. My country is nothing but slush. That is good. circulation going, he was jumping up and down on this cake of ice that kept growing smaller and smaller all the time. He was out there for about a week, flapping his arms up and down like wings just to keep the circulation going.